Okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, is Michael Tracy here? Or is he still asleep? Uh, our keynote speaker. Uh, so, is he here? No. Okay, As, well, if not, he sleeps longer than I do. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> he, I, I thought he, he made a brilliant case yesterday um, to uh, reduce us back or to lead us back to the germ theory and showing that there are that the uh, virus AIDS hypothesis is not just another example of the germ theory, but that there are huge discrepancies between the very reputable germ theory and uh, the virus AIDS hypothesis and other slow virus theories that have risen at the same time. I thought the idea was so brilliant that I copied it too. So <laughs> that I thought about it too. And my original title is down there, and I think they will be joined in some way. Uh, I would say uh, it might be really good to uh, go back, look at back at the violations or the discrepancies between the HIV hypothesis and the original germ theory, on which it heavily relies, as he pointed out over and over yesterday, so heavily that all, in, in, in a religious way almost. Uh, this is the immaculate conception of what it is, and it, it deserved a lot of its reputation, the germ theory, as I'll outline in a second now. So if I could have my next slide. Uh, seasonal epidemics have decimated mankind for, from its beginnings. As Gordon Stewart, our RA activist who didn't come yet, or maybe he's coming still, has outlined in a review article in The Lancet in 1968, but many others have written about it. Examples are the plague and the flu and the polio and the cholera and the pox and the syphilis epidemics that have uh, decimated mankind it, it off and on over the centuries. All of these epidemics have the following in common. They increase exponentially over several months, that is population-wide, and then decline exponentially forming the classical bell-shaped curve uh, that are first, were first described by William Farr, Farr in England in the last century, or more than two centuries ago, that's almost. Examples, if I could quickly forward, and I come to the last points, I think the first one on record at all is the London plague in 1965. And you see, is that pointed there? Well, I don't know, it's okay. You see, the, as it rises exponentially, claiming, uh, oh, thank you, claiming some real life, 6,000, which was a huge number in those days, uh, here, clay, and then going down within weeks again, and gone it was. The survivors were resistant, and the epidemic had gone. The next one shows, the next slide shows another classical ep uh, germ theory epidemic, and this is the well-cited, frequently cited model for our swine flus, or bird flus, or pigeon flus, or whatever, monkey flus, <laughs> that are hyped by the Centers for Disease Control all over the world. And here's one that really happened. This was in 1918. It presumably claimed more lives in a few months than World War I altogether. They argue, and maybe it's right, I don't, I don't trust these numbers totally, but as you can see, it happened in Berlin, in Paris, in London, and in New York, virtually at the same time. It went up for months and declined in, within several months again. Back to the first slide. Oh, wait, there's one more. Huh? Here's another classical one. Here are the polio epidemics of the 40s, 50s, and there were some before. Again, the famous bell-shaped curve ex expanding or, explo or, or exploding within months and declining within months to be gone and leaving resistant survivors and some deaths as well. So back to the first one uh, slide once more, or the second it was, I'm sorry. Uh, the, they have in common that they all rise and decline in bell-shaped curves seasonally. They are spread randomly between the sexes, these epidemics, and the individual develops, individuals develop these diseases only after short latent periods of several days, typically recover within weeks and rarely die. So that's the pattern that, that, uh, that affected mankind for all these centuries. It, they, they were mysterious, uh, they were, it, the seasonal epidemics of these were suspected to be caused by something that could be transmitted by contacts, conta contagion as it was called, or germs, others called it, for centuries, but it could, it wa there was no proof and therefore these epidemics 
were or remained unexplainable and unpreventable until 1982. 82 was really the beginning of the golden age of this germ theory. At that time, Robert Koch had isolated a specific bacterium from tuberculosis patients, had cloned it, that's the term, I explain in a second, and showed that this cloned stock of bacteria, which he derived from a patient, was causing tuberculosis in guinea pigs. That, was a bit, that converted the germ theory from a semi-religious thing to science. From then on, it was microbiology, genetics, and so on. The key to his discovery was the isolation of the bacterium from a plethora of almost harmless, mostly harmless microbes that we constantly carry it around with and that we live with and coexist. They parasitize and symbiose with us in various ways, but not of, most of them don't cause fatal diseases. And they did that by cloning them from single cells on agar plates, on, on gels that feed the bacteria but doesn't, don't allow them to mix with each other. They, they grow up from the point where he dropped them on the petri dish. This is an agar, is an agar gel, a bit, a bit like jelly, almost the same as the jelly that you have out there without buns, by the way. They have jelly and forks and knives and water and, and tea, but no buns. So, so, it, so this is what somebody, if you wiped your shower this morning, I, I took one actually, and put it on an, on an agar gel, as Robert Koch did, you will see all these beautiful things growing up. For microbiologists, it's beautiful. For some people, it might be a horror. These are fungi, they are bacteria, and there are various uh, variants of, of each of them in the same dish. And what he did now is all of these came from one single cell. You have to wait a couple of days until it looks that beautiful. Initially, it looks transparent. He grew up all of these in bottles and said, all right, which one is the guy to be blamed for tuberculosis? And one out of 100 bottles or reservoir or test tubes contained the, the infectious agent. From now on, actually, it was possible. The triumph, the triumph of the germ theory followed right after this discovery with the identification of the bacteria of childbed fever, syphilis, cholera, pneumonia, salmonella, influenza. The viruses were found in, in principle by the same method. Instead of using growing up bacteria, you grow cells and infect them with viruses and, and and, and identify infectious centers. It also led to, to the scientific basis of it, the discoveries of the laws of microbial and viral replication. How these bugs spread, why they are self-limiting, the, the infections, and why they really disappear and allow vaccines, which are all violated by HIV AIDS, as Michael Tracy pointed out, and I'm pointing out again in a former more scientific angle. And it, of course, led to the biggest triumphs, or one of the biggest triumphs of them all from a medical point of view, the cures of bacterial diseases with antibiotics and the prevention of the virus with, uh, with vaccines, the viral epidemics. In the light of the germ theory, the mortality of all infectious diseases combined dropped from over 50% in the days of Robert Koch to about 1% now, and it has been staying there. Never mind SARS, flu, West Nile fiber, fever, Ebola, and whatever it is, glaucoma and AIDS epidemics. It's less than 1% chance that any of us here in Oakland or even in Berkeley or somewhere or in San Francisco, even in San Francisco, will die from any infectious disease. It's going to be Alzheimer's or neurological disease or broken legs or arms or heads and heart disease, not hardly any one of infectious diseases. According to our reappraising uh, re AIDS activist, Gordon Stewart, the germ theory had thus become the most powerful single force in the development of medicine in the past century. And you see it over and over again. All biologists and microbiologists dream of a microbe that causes a disease. They find a vaccine. They are in the textbooks. They have a portion. They have dates. And they can pay for, uh, they can pay for houses even in San Francisco. They have made it. They're on coins everywhere. <laughs> but not if you look for something that is a little more messy. So what are the, the laws of the germ theory, so we're asking. The germ theory explains the once mysterious microbial diseases as wars between attacking bacteria or viruses and defending immune systems. Like all wars, speed is critical. From Julius Caesar to Adolf Hitler, initially it pays if you're fast. It, later on, it doesn't always help. 
The microbes must be fast enough to replicate in sufficient numbers to survive before the immune system strikes back. The immune system must be able to overtake microbes in order to save the host, or else the host is gone, and that wouldn't work either in the long time. The following laws govern these wars. The generation times and multiplication rates of the microbes and the rapid recruitment and clonal expansion of numerous antimicrobial immune cells. And so bacterial under optimal conditions, given a full stomach or a juicy uh, a, a glass of milk, can, uh, can replicate a double in 30 minutes. And, uh, and, and so the multiplication rate is two, one cell becomes two, and the generation time is 30 minutes. So according to this, one bacterium goes, makes two in 30 minutes, four in 60 minutes, nine, uh, eight in 90 minutes, and so on, until it reaches what's called a clinical threshold, a number of bacteria that now hurt somewhere or another. So a typical clinical threshold, depending on the tissue or the site of infection, is between 10 to 8 and 10 to the 10 bacteria. That's a huge number, but Remember, we are huge numbers of cells, many even higher. We are 10 to the 14 cells. We can tolerate uh, problems with 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 10 and still hang in there. So a single bacterium can cause a disease after only 15 hours or 30 bacterial doublings. 15 divided by half an hour, which it takes for a generation time, means 30 generations in 50, uh, 15 hours. So 15 hours in optimal conditions, let's say a full stomach on a beach in Mexico where you drink your first pina colada on the beach with salmonella on it, you don't know it, uh, will now start replicating in your guts. And by in, in about 15 hours, at the latest, it has reached 10 to the 10 bacteria, salmonella bacteria that weren't there before. Two, 1 times 2 to the 15 hours divided by generation is the same as 2 to the 30, and 2 to the 30 is roughly the same as 10 to 10. So this is the formula for diarrhea by a conventional salmonella infection. And there's no way it could be much slower, and there is no way it could be much faster. If it is much slower, the immune system catches it anyway, and there will be an asymptomatic infection, as most of them are. Most of us go to Mexico without Montezuma's revenge. If you come less well prepared and haven't much sleep and eat too much of burritos and too many margaritas, then this one happens. But otherwise, nothing happens. The next one, please, that gives you the, the laws of viral expansion or replication. Animal viruses, including HIV, replicate in susceptible cells in 6 to 24 hours. That's their generation time. And each infected cell produces about 100 new viruses per cycle, per 24 hours. Thus, HIV is a fast lentivirus, meaning it is just as fast as all other viruses, but it's called a lentivirus or a slow virus because it causes disease 10 years later. But it replicates just as fast as flu, as measles, as mumps, as Rausakoma virus, and other retrovirus, or any other animal viruses. They're all in this range. The clinical threshold of disease for the viruses is much like bacteria, 10 to the to 9, uh, 9 to 10 to the 12 infected cells, depending on the site of infection, make a disease. Accordingly, let's take a blood-borne virus, like HIV is said to be. Let's take mononucleosis virus. It's a herpes type or Epstein-Barr virus. You pick it up by kissing, it's one mechanism, we call it kissing disease. But you can pick it up by other contacts too. I'm sure you could have Sex and needles and all such things could also transmit it. But kissing is enough in this case. With HIV, not. Gallo said, I asked him once, he had, when they advertised that one should, kissing could transmit HIV. Viruses could be transmitted by kissing, as they should be. And he said, um, in, in a warning in, the, in Building 37, I was, I was there for sabbatical, I said, how much, uh, he, he said, heavy, but kissing is all right if it's casual, but heavy is. Heavy saliva exchange in kissing is advised against. And that was in the elevator of Building 37. I asked him, could you give some numbers? How much saliva needs to be exchanged <laughs> to pick up HIV? And he got very furious. He stepped out of the wrong floor, swearing at me that I, that I have only chemistry in the, in the mind instead of understanding love and HIV. But anyway, so I never understood quite well. Mm. 
Anyway, so what I'm saying is here, an orthodox virus like mononuclear.